Hi, it's Susan from Well Peaceful. And I was going to put the light on to do this video, but I've just turned it off and I've noticed the screen is more pixelated, which I like because it, it's got a bit of a matrix feel to it. <laughs> the topic I'm going to talk about is technocracy or democracy, which was in my mind this morning on waking. And I knew I had to do the video. This is definitely the case. And it really drives to the heart of Many of the videos I'm doing actually, particularly on digital. So I want to go still to start with, as I usually do, in order to get clarity around the subject. Because it's not, even in human language, we can say technocracy or democracy, which then sets up a sense of an adversarial one or the other. In truth, they are actually not mutually exclusive. There is potential for the merging of both of them. But at the moment, the way the digital is playing out, it's replacing democracy. So I wanna go still because I'm talking to those technocrats um, who are forming this brave new world and that is the way I see it. Or it could be, I just wanna go still on the words or it could facilitate the evolution of humanity in the right hands. So I wanna go still. It's being served up as the fourth industrial revolution, like it's the next big thing. I see that as a fallacious statement. I don't see it, it as a evolutionary jump in that sense. Which is interesting that I'm saying that given just what I said. So I'm going to go still on that again. Why? Because love is not present in the formulation of the technology. The difference being, and even though the wording is the same, The evolution of humanity is coming through the expansion of love within humanity. This is the next step. Now, what is the evolution of humanity? The evolution of humanity is that we are recognizing that we're all interconnected naturally. I very much feel and sense parallels between the technocracy and the true evolution of the humanity, which is why I introduced this video in the way that I did quite unexpectedly. I wasn't actually planning to go in that direction. There is no plan with my videos, <laughs> but I wouldn't normally go in that direction. But what I'm seeing very clearly in my mind is an attempt at oneness through technology, but it's doing it without the love. And that's why and I will say the words I'm saying, I'm feeling because this has to be coming from freedom of speech, which is in service to humanity. I see the next big extinction event. That's what came into my mind without the love. With the love, balance will be restored. It won't be a technocracy, but technology could be possibly utilised in a future. But it must be evolved through love. So love has to be imbued in the design and the invention of technologies in service of humanity, not to control humanity. There's a huge difference when you're working in service to humanity or you're working in service to greed. They take us down two completely different trajectories. And humanity can choose to go down either pathway, but it has to be fully informed on the decisions it's making. At the moment, there's a lot of unconsciousness around the marketing drive for IT smart cities, the embedding of sensors in buildings, in smart meters, where they can know all the activity within the house, 
using the electrical lines in order to sense, gather data. Public don't understand this. There's also the thermal mapping of buildings, suburbs or neighbourhoods if you're an American. Still use Australian ac acronyms. <laughs> Well, sort of suburbs is what we, we typically say. The filming through the LED lights as a form of monitoring, the monitoring surveillance paradigm overlaid over the design of technology is problematic for, for humans, for people as their whole life becomes mapped, tracked, profiled, etc. Now I want to go still again because I want to go into the essence of technocracy versus democracy because it's really fundamental and we're actually at a really important point right now with the collapsing of the global economy which in my inner feeling is preparing the way for a technocracy. because governments have come together and stopped activity, which has decimated the small to medium sized businesses, the family businesses. The somewhat money cash economy is being collapsed, which is reforming the way we do activity. So I wanna go still about that. Technocracy versus democracy is what I'm wanting to go into. Okay, it immediately takes me into the male versus the female or the masculine versus the female or feminine. The inspiration I had this morning on waking was really looking at men and the need for power. Science and technology has typically been the platform males have used in order to have a superiority over the female. What I sensed this morning was the loss of power of the masculine who is grabbing for that power, believing that they have no identity if they're not in control. So if you like, the rising feminine is being perceived as a threat to those who have anchored themselves in a masculine form of power. And I do understand this masculine. I was trained in economics and I, I worked as a market analyst and I was in the masculine in my um, intellectual mindset. Life became boxes analysis, research. I thought rationally. I did background research in order to understand the public or the consumer at that time. I did demographics. I did data gathering. I did statistical profiling in order to understand the consumer so that the client could market more things to that consumer. The name of the game was profit maximization. The name of the game was not loving the public. The name of the game is status and power. And as a professional, I wasn't actually consciously really considering these things because I had a little bit of a detachment from my own feminine or my sense of wholeness, which is when you unite those two. The masculine and the feminine are, are in every human being, but there's a, a dominant orientation typically. So testosterone in the males will amplify that masculine. The estrogen within the female, so these are the hormones, will amplify the receptive, the feminine. Now they are different, but very, very important in respect of becoming whole, becoming a whole person. When you're in balance, personally, you will have 
confronted your own masculine and feminine within and you will have found a balance. So there will be activities where I've had to step up and become more forthright, where I've had to logically think through things, where I've had to claim my place. That is a masculine approach. When I step into the feminine, the poet immediately comes to my mind. The clown does too, actually, because I've, I've been a clown and I've interacted with the humanity from a feeling, intuitive sense, where I've sensed my boundaries, where I've sensed those parameters as I've moved through the community and given love to people, unconditional love. That is very enhanced within the feminine because of the caring role of the, of the woman for the child. It's part of the natural order. The female, the emotional intelligence is amplified in the feminine because she must be able to sense the emotional condition of her child in order for that child's well-being to be optimised. These are very powerful skills of sensing this is the other side of the technocracy. This is the real sensing, feeling. And I always sense, I'm jumping across to the technocracy, I'm sensing a desire for the same thing, but it's being, if you like, implemented through technology as a interface to these powers that are actually inherent within the human condition naturally. Even intuition is a form of predictability. Intuition is tuning in. It's not d gathering data in a logical linear sense to, in order to get predict that predict that landscape, predict those preemptive actions. The feminine doesn't need to go into that because inherent within the prediction of a technological frame is control. In the feminine, the inner sense, if you like, of intuition is coming from well-being. It's developed in order to assure the well-being of that other. I have a feeling about this. I don't think it's a good idea for you to go down that path. This is the mother. This is the energy of the parental love for that other. There is no you owe me in that. It's I love you. And my feeling is it wouldn't be wise to go down that path. So wisdom is inherent within the feminine. I'm going to go into the wisdom. Wisdom. It's, a, it's an even deeper intuition than intuition, interestingly enough. I want to try and get words to it because we don't really talk about wisdom we talk about wise philosophers. We all quote things and people get impressed. <laughs> you know, they go, oh, that person's wise. And we all oh, make sense. I know that. It's true. It's true. This is the philosophies that have sought to enlighten or hold that light to humanity when it's in a state of darkness, particularly. The philosophers emerge because people are looking for direction, they lost. <laughs> so I'm going to go into wisdom and then I'll continue on that path of technocracy versus democracy because they're all interwoven. I'm seeing an interweaving. Wisdom, wise, wise decisions. There's a maturity immediately is the feeling I have inherent within the word or the experienced state of wisdom. It's not in the word, it's actually, and the word can actually be translated as the word as well, I just felt. <laughs> it's not in the word. It might sound wise, because you're reading from the word, but the true wisdom is actually inherent within the human condition as experienced as now. It's our direct experience. And it's coming from experience. <laughs> Wisdom is always coming. You cannot go and learn it in books at a university and come out and say, right, I'm a philosopher, I'm wise. No, 
You have to suffer. <laughs> Wisdom comes from suffering in actual fact. <laughs> suffering is a lived experience. And with suffering, the reason why suffering produces wisdom is because when you're in a lot of pain, you have to find the truth. So wisdom is really the culmination of the search for truth and coming to a point of knowing. Ah, I know this is true. I know this. When I've read certain books, I've had an inherent connect of wisdom where I've gone, I know it. And I, it's been in my experience. So wisdom is in the feminine, the true wisdom. Philosophy as an intellectual um, man of letters is the words I'm feeling to say, man of letters, because it's come from, you know, 16th, 15th, 16th century or well, the Enlightenment. Philosophers replaced the religious, which were seen as the conduits for God on earth, the religion had a lot of power to the point that my way is the only way. You have sinned. And typically those who became the learned ones, the educated ones, were educated through a religious film, filter, so the philosophers came in to replace, to challenge the worldview of God and saw it as unproven. So the scientists came in and said, well, that's all fantasy. Where's your evidence? They brought in Newtonian physics. Sitting under the tree, gravity the physical universe could be calculated through mathematics. This was the challenge to the power of the church, you see, because all the people's power was given over to the authority of the church, which was a direct link to God. Same applies with royalty as well. I've often been seen as the divine conduit. <laughs> this is how power formulated. I guess that's why I'm going there is that I'm actually getting to the seed essence of power itself. This is the externalized power, not the inner power, which is the real power. I just want to sit with the philosophers for a moment and the religions and that clash. Because there was a fight <laughs> between them, <laughs> you know, one side saying it's not provable. The other side saying you have to trust. One side saying we need to get an evidence base. The other side saying I get direct revelation. Now, what's interesting about these polarities that I'm playing with right now is that there is the essence. I can feel a little bit of a, just an essence of the feminine masculine principle playing out in that as well. Because the feminine often is the intuitive. You'll find at mind, body and spirit gatherings, it's mostly women. I noticed that and I went, isn't that interesting? In church, it can be it's, it's mostly females, I think, but there's family groups. in Because the church tends to be one more about community and people are trying to find morality in their lives in order to live good lives they want to be good people that's the aspiration but like anything it can get distorted when power becomes the default in the sense that those who are given too much power and it's the you know the people are doing it they're handing over their power and saying you know better and then these ones become more powerful. And this is where we get the Catholic Church, the big Vatican, the money that comes around all of this. And when they get into the commercialization of it, they lose their connection to that higher spiritual power. And I just want to go into why that is. <laughs> so I'll close my eyes because I need to con consider that. Greed, <laughs> immediately greed comes up. 
that's why they lose the disconnect. Sorry, they lose the connection to the inner felt experience of the divine, if you like, become severed when they shift their focus to the wealth, the power, the intrigue, the politics, the commercial. As soon as they shift, that's your temptation coming in, which they often talk about with the devil, so to speak. I don't actually believe in a devil, but I understand there is evil. Yes, it does exist, but I don't see a physical being as such. There's an energy around that dark force. So greed becomes a temptress. Because I have to go into this, isn't it interesting? Somehow it seems to have a, a bearing on the topic at large. The restrictions that were created through religion, such as for the priests, they can't have sex, they can't marry. These became blockages of nature because it's natural to desire union with a woman or a man. They had to suppress those natural inclinations in order to appear to be holy, to have married God, to have become devout. There are words are coming around this. I'm just going to try and feel them. The monk, celibacy. I feel the words devotion, devotion, singular focus, repetitive chanting, repetitive, repetitive mind control through spoken word. Now, please forgive me for those who do follow the books, the words. I'm not trying to be disrespectful of your faith. I'm just going with intuitive and I'm not filtering it, okay? A really powerful desire for union with God for those who are truly devout. Adepts. These are the students of this practice. So their life was not normal in the sense of a normal family life, man, woman, child, or woman, man, child. I'm reversing the order because patriarchy has placed it in that order and it's, it's not the natural order. The natural order is the woman supporting the child, the man supporting the woman. So it's not a hierarchical order. It's, a, it's actually coming from beneath. It's a supportive, um, it's support, not order is the natural family. It's one of support. That's what community is about, support. Support means I serve you. So the man is serving the woman to serve the child is the natural support is the accurate words. The church hived off, disconnected the priest who is predominantly a male from the feminine in order to know God, which was going to distort that union because he hadn't developed a merging with the feminine within. He had not become integrated as a human. He was very much pinched off in order to become this devotee. And you become very single-minded when you're exposed to a certain way of thought without those natural experiences coming in although experiences of course happen because many of them go out to the poor they are interacting with the community and there's some very beautiful Francis of Assisi comes straight to my mind very beautiful beautiful teachers but I'm looking at the structure of religion when I'm talking in this way and, and what it creates so there is by and large this disconnect and a disconnect is going to go into the heart of what has evolved over time into a technocracy as well there's a disconnect there as well it's just it's just sort of manifesting in a different way but i'm sensing that these two connect 
And also there's a really deep bed of compassion here within me for those. And I don't even like to label people technocrats and this and that because really even that creates a them and us and I'm, I'm really not keen on it. But I do need to define it because it is a state of mind that's developing, that's detached from its full humanity, from its full feminine. Now, I feel to be going back to the fear of the feminine because that seems to be a factor over time, the fear of the feminine's power. This is the power of the mother who a child grows up with. The mother is, is like God. So these things I can feel overlaps with. For the child, the mother is like God, and it's not to discount the father. There's beautiful fathers without a doubt, but the feminine is the, the female is the dominant parent in a child's life without a doubt. This is the authority figure in a child's life. They go to their mother. When they hurt themselves, they run to mum. When they're really vulnerable, they go to their mums, not their dads, typically, unless the dad is very soft. But they're drawn to the softness. They're drawn to, I don't want to be hurt emotionally. And the feminine, because she's predominantly wired for emotional intelligence, she knows how to respond to that child's deep need to be heard, to be cuddled, to be nurtured. That nurturing is great power. The planetary ecosystem is based on the feminine. It's nurturing. It's designed in a way that supports life. That's why Mother Earth has been called that. Gaia has been seen in the form of the feminine because that's our scrappling for words to make sense of something that supports our life. Support is not order. Support is not control. Support is merging and it's emerging. It's the very nourishment that the human condition requires in order to fulfill its highest potential. So it's not a small thing, but the feminine or the mother has been diminuted to the point of she's a single mother and there's disparagement around that. Again, because the male's not there to protect her and there's a certain element of bullying of that vulnerable person who's trying to raise a child. In truth, these women are not that vulnerable. They're actually extremely strong. In my experience, the love is extremely strong for the child and they push through every barrier, even hold down jobs to try and raise their children. This is power. And that's where this threat of the feminine comes from is the inherent and felt power of the female overwhelming the male. She's also good at organising. She's a natural leader. The leadership is not about controlling other people. This is something that came to me in inspiration not long ago. The true leader is the one who makes their own decisions. It's actually empowerment is leadership. This is the lead oneself. You don't need to lead a whole bunch of people to be a leader. In fact, forcing uh, control through fear of consequence by not doing as I say is not leadership. It's actually control. But it calls itself a leader. And we have profiled leaders in the past who were the most brutal, controlling, insecure people. And we've put them up on a pedestal and said, that is the ideal. We've, in, we've glorified the violence. The violent acts has been minimised, but the winning of the battle has been maximised. This is distortion of history or his story can be formed that way. Now, that may challenge people and they might say, Oh, this is putting men down. No, it's not. It's not. It's bringing in another dimension to the story that has been pinched off. It's actually been left to the side. Her story has been left to the side. The whole of history has been framed in the masculine. The hero heroism of the mother, mother has actually not been considered worthy of even stories and yet from my own lived experience having witnessed mothers I've never seen so much courage non-violent courage so what I'm doing in a sense in this narrative is, is seeking to balance and I, again I'm going back to the threat of the feminine because I'm feeling strongly to do that 
The homeostasis that I talk about in my videos more and more now, which is the true peace, is balance. So this is not about matriarchy, you know, taking over the patriarchy. It's nothing to do with that. It's about um, parity. It's about equalising. It's the scales of justice. It's the true nature of an optimal human condition, which is the balancing of the masculine and the feminine because both are needed for balance. You can't do away with males and say, well, look, I can do it on my own. I can reproduce through technology. <laughs> We're getting to that. <laughs> through a test tube. I don't need the males. Don't worry about any of that. That may well be the case with IMF and what have you, but ultimately males and females need each other. And this world will not be beautiful if one is disempowered at the expense of the other and it's not beautiful when it, this is the case right now. It's actually not beautiful. It, it's a distorted reality that favours a certain orientation and says that this is the way follow me. It's actually not the way follow me. Until those two come into balance, into homeostasis as equal, yet different, equal opportunity, equal potential, equal possibility is what that equality means. And it means that I don't put you down because of your gender. And this can be both ways because I know men get put down too. So there's a, there's a whole wrath, you know, of information around female violence too in the home. I know. And that's something that's not been talked about. But that is a reality too, and I'm here to speak truth to all. And the female violence is definitely being minimised, but it's there. And that is um, mental harassment. That is complaints because she can't find her power. Blaming the man, organising him, making him do this, that and the other. And some men like it. But even that in itself is a form of not respecting, not supporting the flourishing of that person too. So I'm saying this to be fair because I know that the ego of males will get, you know, press, pressed here because they're accustomed to a narrative which puts them in a... And I think too, to be fair to them too, I think they often are in negative lights too because the... Violence is predominantly being, the physical violence is predominantly being um, conducted by males because they're getting frustrated and they're not able to exp express their feelings and it translates into violence, that powerlessness. And that is an actual fact within the male, the suppression of the feminine. That's why that happens. The violence is only occurring on the planet because the, the feminine's been suppressed in the male. So patriarchy has actually held men down. Now, this is a fairly long narrative, I know, but I can never know where it's going to go. But the theme of it is technocracy versus democracy was what I awoke with this morning, and I'm going to continue with that. So the technocratic mindset has its roots in this patriarchal power that wants to maintain its power. Now, it tends to have its superior, superiority located in science and technology. As we see technology being embedded in language, we see science and technology being embedded in education because of the marketing of STEM, science, technology, engineering and maths, which is a male orientation. And they might say, no, we want women in this Women are not naturally drawn to technology and building and it's not to say they don't do it, they do, but the feminine tends to move in a different way. I just want to go still on that because we have orientations. It's to do with the logical linear with the science and the focus. Males tend to like to really focus and they're quieter, there's less chatter going on in the mind because they're not communicators as women are. And this is not a disparagement of women, by the way. Communication's incredibly important. 
But the silence of the males, is that true? I just want to go there. It's actually a Western cultural programmed experience. Why is that? Because we're more in the masculine in the Western world. We're more in the left, uh, right brain, left brain, sorry, left brain logical. Now, I contrasted that very quickly in my mind with the Italians who are very touchy-feely, expressive, chatters. I think Arabs are too. I think the Arab people are, I think they are. I haven't had a lot to do with them, but I think they're more communicative, more communal. There's more family around them. The Western tends to be more atomized, isolated, singular. It's not a group culture. So the male tends to become more siloed. I'm just feeling for that because this is coming out of the West, predominantly, the STEM, science, technology, engineering and maths. Now, they have expanded it to STEAM. <laughs> always laugh when I see that. Science, technology, engineering, arts <laughs> and maths. <laughs> see, they couldn't put I in there. STEM. <laughs> because that's innovation and they're calling innovation the creativity the great creativity but it's actually not it is and it's not why is that i just want to go still on that innovation creativity innovation has the power of commerce behind it and it means we want you to come up with design there's still a drafting sort of logic to design as distinct from the unparalleled, unfettered, creative flair that's spontaneous, <laughs> which is what they want to shut down. They don't want spontaneity. We want predictability, control. <laughs> and the feminine, of course, is, is going, no, I'll do it my own way because <laughs> that's the way feminine is. <laughs> Although they can conform to, that's true. So STEAM, interesting. I see that as an appeasement to say, hey, it's not all about men. It's about women too. That's what I see in that. And then we have pictures of females. Look, female technocrat, female technocrat, female technocrat. See, you can be like them. I don't want to be like them. No offence. I'm just bringing me into it now. <laughs> Moved out of intuition. <laughs> I just want to go into that difference. It's just a difference. We're really strong nurturers, and we are. We love community. We love people. We love chatting. That's why it's hard to get the girls focused on the technology because they're not interested. <laughs> they're just going, so did you see that nice guy? You know, what do you think? <laughs> you know, the girls talk like that, the young girls. He's really gorgeous. Oh, I watched that film last night. That was amazing. <laughs> That's girls. <laughs> They're not going, oh, wow, did you see the way they soldered that um, piece onto the motherboard? You know, isn't that chip incredible? Look how much power capacity it has. Oh, my God, a capacitor. Fascinating. Oh, we can bump up the megahertz on that. We'll solder this in onto the motherboard. And that's not to say that girls can't learn these things they do i've got a niece who, who's done welding she's pretty amazing but she's a fabulous artist amazing i'm quite but she's had a father that said you can do anything he taught her how to um taught her mechanics taught her how to fix her car his car <laughs> so she actually didn't have any filters so in a lot of ways whilst i move across these this feeling here when fathers treat their daughters in a sense, like sons, but not in a rough way. They're saying to the daughter that you can do anything. Now, when daughters have fathers like that, you can do anything. That means those girls will try those things. They'll give them a go. And they will. And some of them might do it very well because there's, there's feminine, there's, there's masculine females. I've talked about this before too. I know of females who are very male. And what I mean by that is they're attracted to fast cars. They're attracted to fixing cars. They'll go and get out the hammer and they'll screw things in the wall. They'll fix the TV. This is the, 
And again, I, even in my narrative, it gives the impression that males fix things, girls don't. You know, this is not actually true. I want to go deeper into this because I can feel stereotypes too, but I can also see the breaking down of those barriers as well. So I guess I'm entertaining STEM. <laughs> see, and this is where truth takes you. You entertain it. I'm not going hard and fast. I'm just, because I'm seeking the truth here, I'm blending so let's go back into the true feminine, the true masculine. Oh, isn't it funny? I didn't even have to close my eyes. Immediately I saw boys as girls. Boys before testosterone kicks in are actually in the feminine. And in the womb, I've talked about this before. If we look at the chromosomes, we've got the XX for female, XY for male. Well, what's the common denominator in the chromosomes? X is the common denominator, that's the feminine. Male comes from female. Now, all the Christians and the religiosity will go, no, it doesn't, she came from the rib. <laughs> Come on, do you really believe? This is probably where the clash with science and religion came from, was the idea that Eve came from the rib. It's a hard one. You'd have to, how do you genetically modify that and create a fully functioning female from the rib? But in that story comes the idea that, that she has to be inferior to the male. She's the rib of him. Not true. The sperm, the egg, is where the point of unification happens and there's an equality in that. There are lots and lots of sperms that are released in that moment of creation, that beautiful moment of the creation of a life which does not come from human beings that was we were designed so the human in its beauty we didn't create is the first thing you got to understand the sperm and the egg we didn't create but that joins and wonderful life replicates through this incredible dna that replicates cells has generations of DNA inherent within these helixes, these, they look like ladders in the science. Anaguine, 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 cytosine, chiasine. I'm feeling for the protein bonds. I'm actually seeing the, the words, I'm actually seeing the lettering going down the side of the helix. Cytosine, anine. I'm feeling the chemical bonds. The chemical bonds which create the human bonds. So anyway, these bonds is the blueprint of the human which replicates them like cells. But always in that fetus, the male is a female, always in the initial stages. So the male is a female, female, man. Inherent within that word is the man. The man is within the female. The masculine is within the feminine. The feminine is within the masculine. But the masculine is coming from the feminine. Why? Because the feminine is the bringer of life. Is that, you know, the life is birthing through the feminine. So it's not about him versus her. He is her. So what he denies in her, he's denying in himself. So when he says you're weak, you're over emotional, you know, you don't know anything, you're not logical. When he puts her down, he's putting down an aspect of himself, which is why we grow in the directions we grow. But I know why he's choose he's he's marching off down a pathway in independence because he's breaking away from the mother, who's very powerful in his life. 
And the mothers would just cleave onto their children and say, oh, keep you safe. <laughs> He's going, no, I won't want to be safe. If you don't want to be safe, you might want to note that in the current times. He's marching off in order to find himself. Now, the female story, of course, if she doesn't have, if she doesn't get impregnated early, she also will do that too, which is what I did. I didn't have children, so I've actually gone down the path of the, it's not even the path of the males, it's the human condition. I went off and found my own way. I became a woman. I became a real woman. <laughs> and I'm not saying a mother isn't. I've actually been told by a man that he wouldn't look at a woman unless she had children. <laughs> And I just laughed. I thought, far out. I didn't know there was prejudice around not having children. <laughs> As if somehow I'm not going to look after him or something. I'm, I'm not. He's right. Because <laughs> that's what he was looking for, his mum, in, in the shape of a wife. He wants to be nurtured. But you can still have the nurturing in a balanced homeostasis type of relationship where the two merge. But... The true love is not about making you a prisoner of my love. The true love is I love myself. Let's celebrate together. You love yourself. You don't need me because the minute needs in there, there's greed and fear. Did you know that the highest love has no need in it at all? I found that out and I was like, that makes sense. The highest love has no need in it at all. There's freedom. You would want the other to be free because you want them to live fully in their own life. And that doesn't mean you don't come together. It doesn't mean you don't share things, but you don't own each other. That's the true love. We're not even at that point yet because we're so insecure. We're, we're still trying to get what we didn't get as children, you see, because we haven't done early childhood properly. And with the techn technocracy, they're wanting to disconnect the child from the mother, and they are. They want them housed in childcare centres like institutionalised so they have more control over the development of the child into this technocracy. This is a strategy, I've read about it, and it's highly concerning because it's a, a dysfunctional technocracy when they're trying to cut that bond between the mother and the child. Then they put them on devices, and this is where the neural networks get changed in the child. Because when you're fo focusing in a linear, logical way all the time, you're constantly coming from the left brain. That overdevelops, and so the world becomes boxes and concepts, which is very much anchored in the, the male way of seeing. Males tend to think in compartments. Females tend to integrate everything because we're very creative, but we use left and right hemispheres. That's where we differ, and that's why often women have great verbal facility is because of the neural networks. It's not that women are better than men. It's just that we are wired through the estrogen in a way that brings the masculine and the feminine together because we're raising children, the next generation. We have to, and not all women do, and I, I see a neurosis in women too. There's an imbalance there as well. Women have to become integrated with the masculine and the feminine, but because they're disempowered, they tend to minimise um, who they are because constantly the structures embedded within the society are favouring the commerce, they're favouring the intellectual or the tradesperson and the feminine aspects are shrinking down more and more, which is the caring sector, which is the most important sector, the most important. Without a fully developed feminine we get the wars that we're seeing in the world. So the technocracy has come out of the, the military. It's come out of science. I'm seeing Academy of Science. It's come out of manufacturing product because this is a very scientific process that takes place here. I remember going to a factory where they made foam and I saw how it was coming, how it was being formulated in a process, a heat process. It was very fascinating. So science is embedded within industry. And because ecological systems are breaking down and they don't want to lose power, 
they've evolved this other technocracy which will replace democracy. And, and my long narrative around the disconnect between the masculine and the feminine, even religion and how it embeds in either faith, it's embedded in philosophy too. There was male philosophers. The fem female philosophy was completely discounted because she was the mother and we want to keep her barefoot and pregnant out of the way. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> and the technocracy is wanting the same. Just keep, well, we'll put her into STEM. But again, she's not being invited as an equal partner in this collaboration. Of course, there's IT specialists who are females, but they're coming into the male um, paradigm. This is not a fusing of the um, masculine and the feminine to create a new future, which is in homeostasis with the planet. This technological revolution is electricity based. It's motherboard based. It's control based. It's the same thing as all the previous revolutions, if it's that. It's just manifested through IT now. And then they can control all data. They can, they can um, make money out of the data. They can map and control everyone. And if you get out of line, they can take you out because the technocracy disconnects from the humanity. So it will objectivize you. That's why it's called the Internet of Things. It's objects. It sees the world as boxes. It's a highly disconnected mindset that completely discounts the feminine. The reason I started off with technocracy versus democracy is that democracy is about sharing, caring. It's about everybody having a right to say things. It's about the human right to rebalance power which says hey you're hurting me you're forcing me into a mold that doesn't work for me that's actually damaging me emotionally and physically now the social emotional stuff people go oh that's all fantasy it's all illusion it's not i've been through it i have confronted technocracy and what i saw was complete disregard for my well-being even when i was driven to the point of not wanting to be here anymore there was no compassion at all towards me. No one reached out, not once. There was no middle ground here of, I'm sorry, I realise now where you're coming from. And yes, you do have a right to be heard fairly. Yes, you do um, have a right to say no to something that may harm you. You do have a right to communicate without it being labelled. This is the rebalancing of the masculine and the feminine that we call conflict resolution. But on that deeper level, that's the rebalancing. That's homeostasis, that's peace. But when you say you have no right, you will do as I say, you just tick the box. Terms and conditions, your responsibility to read them. We may change them, but that's your problem. We don't care about what you want. We want, what, we want you to want what we want. And we're gonna rewire you in order for you to agree with it because that's con we're going to control the human condition to make sure it fits that box. Now, it's flights of fancy. It's desire to break out of that confinement, that prison, that psychological prison that's been constructed here will be met with brute force. They'll say it's non-compliance. And then you will get a consequence and a punishment as a result to train you to comply. Operant conditioning, they call that. This is the dangerous aspect of a technocracy that does not love. It becomes a compliance framework that doesn't respect democracy anymore, that wants to collapse government. This is actually your espionage. It wants to collapse government. It wants global government. It doesn't want free thinking because that's a disruption to it. Hence, it calls itself disruption. It may well repackage itself as the saviour for humanity. This is more efficient. This is more organised. This is order out of chaos. It only looks like chaos because you haven't known yourself. To know thyself and be true means there's no chaos. You go with the flow of life knowing you're not in control. That's where the peace exists.
within that type of framework. What is chaos? Chaos theory immediately comes to me. I actually see self-replication, infinite, infinite, meaning the actual blueprint repeats, 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 which is the stability. Chaos theory. I see the butterfly effect flapping the wings at one part of the world, transformation occurring in another. I want to go into chaos. I don't mind chaos personally. I actually like it. <laughs> I'm used to uncertainty. It's normal for me. <laughs> so even when the coronavirus pandemic happened and everybody slowed down, I was actually happy because <laughs> I was like, yay, they're jumping off the bandwagon, beauty. <laughs> And as for social isolation, well, that's normal for me. I'm constantly socially isolated because <laughs> I'm going my own way. See, I'm trekking out like the fool, off in my own direction. And that often is alone because I don't have that many people who are resonating with, with me or I'm not meant to. I'm meant to go it alone. You know, path less travelled, they call it, the road less travelled. That's normal. So economic activity for me being slowed is a good thing because of the natural breather that happens for the planet itself because our bandwagon that we're going to jump back on very soon is what's destroying life on earth but we won't be reading that in the news because that's controlled by the conservatives <laughs> power and control operates a narrative quick control information feed them a line keep repeating it so they believe it mind control and that's how power and control operates. So I want to go back to chaos because that's what my uh, power and control wants to stave off. It doesn't want chaos. It actually wants control and order. <laughs> it's very got that very fascist sort of, you know, you can feel Hitler's vibration around that because it's like, doo, 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 doo. you know, you will do as I say or you will go to the bloody gulag. See the gulags? March them off, get rid of them. See, we've got the energy of that coming around all of this because there's no love there. And that's the great weakness in the technocracy is that it doesn't love. It becomes, and it sees that as power, it sees that as strength. Is In the face of this, I don't flinch because they see the weakening, they feel the weakening when their emotions are experienced and they don't like it. And see, when we, um, I just want to, I need to go here. When we go into the emotion and we feel ourselves weakening, we're not weakening, we're merging. It's a natural, see, we're egalitarian and we are a group species in truth. Trying to go it alone, but our natural instinct is agrarian. It's to gather in groups. It's family-based. But because of technology and business and, you know, certain groups of people become workers, certain groups become this, certain groups become that. We've kind of tried to design society in the image of industry and it's always dysfunctional and it never works because it never um, naturally meets the true need of the human condition, which is not to work eight hours a day or more. It's actually to socialise. It's to be creative. It's to be active, of course. That's natural condition. But it's predominantly a creative um, intelligence which is constantly thinking of new things and we live from one moment to the next which is constantly unknown and so the insecurity that many are feeling is coming from that state of I don't know what's next and therefore that framework of control or compliance is a way of trying to get some sort of order out of what is perceived as chaos I need to get a handle on it so I can control it otherwise I'm out of control if I'm out of control I feel weak I'm vulnerable and that's the unconscious that's not looked at in the more integrated way of seeing when you're used to uncertainty you're used to not being in control 
but you're used to making decisions as a form of your own empowerment, you learn to adapt to that change that, that forms around you. You just adapt. You might have a bit of grumbling here and there, but ultimately you adapt because you recognise the truth of the matter is you're not in control. So you've got to flow with it. And the natural ecosystem is all about those flows. So you come into alignment with what's natural and that becomes an easier path. The hard path is the one of force, co coercion, control, edicts, trying to get the whole world into your image so that you feel safe. It's an impossible process because you cannot control life itself. You can't. And life is not just here on Earth. It's in the cosmos. The whole of life is emerging. It, it is a massive life system beyond the earth. So we are subject to the nature, not the compliance. And this is why I've said in the past it won't work. And it's not it's not as an us versus, versus them. It's got nothing to do with that. It's to do with the natural condition. When you know yourself and be true, you'll come into harmony with that idea that nature is actually in control. Nature is the blueprint. And even if you tinker at with it here on the earth, and you decimate it through over-extraction, over-consumption, not over-population, over-consumption. That's the core issue that no one wants to face because that means you have to change what you do. It's no longer about maximising outputs. It becomes, it's actually about my consumption. That drives to the heart of the whole economic paradigm, which lives off economic growth as stability and security. It's not. It's a fake reality. Defaulting back to the blueprint is to learn to go with the flow. It's to find a balance with the masculine and the feminine. It's to recognise you're not in control. I'm, I'm coming back to chaos. I haven't I've forgotten it. I'm just on a trajectory here. It's balancing the masculine and the feminine. It's feeling your feelings. So if you're a male, you need to learn to feel your feelings more. If you're female, you need to start to logically... Um, think out certain things in order to balance the two. You need to get out there, get in, start building something. The, ma the masculine needs to stay with the children, start to watch them, not, not get them busy, but play with them, which men do actually. I have noticed that. Typically in the home, the males play with the children, and I like that. <laughs> so that, that's good for them to have that bonding with their children, and I love seeing that because I want the family to come together. I don't want it to be any archy, whether it's patriarchy or matriarchy. I'm not interested. The matriarchy will take care of the whole family, but ultimately we want the homeostasis where both are respected and both are in the appropriate natural um, support structure, which ensures the survival and thriving of the species. The neglect of children through an economic paradigm, which has always put its focus on money, not children, in a feminine-centred paradigm, the child would be at the centre. Just know that. Women would do it differently. And you will find it's a more secure society. There'll be no violence. So the industrial military complex won't want that. They would want, and I bring them in because I was reading something of Susan Linderher just recently. I was reading about 9-11 um, and how it was an inside job. And they had a peace plan on the table, which she said was a beautiful peace plan. She was a CIA asset. She, and I won't forget what she wrote. She talked about the one, the only player in the table who did not like the peace process in Iraq, this is prior to bombing Iraq, was the industrial military complex because they make money out of the weaponry. And again, this is the male science, technology, engineering and maths being used for um, profit making out of murdering of people. And it is, and you can call it whatever you want, I don't care. The real words have to be used because it's we're getting to a point where the science and technology can actually destroy the planet four times over. We've got nuclear weapons and now we've got bioweapons, which, which could release um, a biological entity into the environment again and this time wipe out majority of the population. So we have to take on board these narratives in the public interest most definitely 
because they're the subject matter that people will not be talking about because they're too scared. Um, they don't want someone in a black van coming and taking them away. Well, if it happens, it happens. I love humanity. I'm not going to be silenced. Um, although I, I'm open to dialogue, of course, and someone can knock on my door and say, look, we want to talk about what you've just talked about. I'm going to go, okay, let's let's discuss it. So my mind is always open to those who may have a differing perspective. Of course, that's democracy. Democracy welcomes in the opposite. It doesn't suppress it or shut it down. In its true nature, democracy was about hearing all voices. And what often happens is when you feel uncomfortable about hearing a voice that doesn't resonate with what you think is true, your instinct is to shut them down, disparage them, malign them or get rid of them. That's an immature approach to difference. The mature and evolved approach will be life has brought me this tension. I'm going to go to a higher narrative now. This is where we're all one. On a higher level, I have brought this other who's causing me tension to me for a purpose because we're all connected, which is what I said in the beginning. We're all one. Now, there's something, if I'm feeling tension around what they're saying, there's something unhealed within me. And what that means is I'm out of harmony with nature. Because even that opposite number, who I may have judged as wrong, which can certainly look like in this narrative, I might be wrong. I may have judged that and said, you're a this and I'm a that. The minute I go into these dichotomies, even the wording of democracy versus technocracy can create a false division. But unfortunately, I have to use language and it's, it's awkward language. Because we're blended. In the, in, if I sit in front of someone who, who's involved in techno, technology, I'm going to warm towards them immediately because they're human. But they have to be in front of me. On the computers, we disconnect because it's technology. That's what it does. So life brings me this opposite in order for me to acknowledge, if I'm coming from a higher perspective, that there's something unhealed within me. What heals it is forgiveness is fearlessness, is love. They're here for a purpose. So that technocracy is here for a purpose without a doubt. And it may well be ushering in this higher perspective without even knowing it because it's creating its opposite. So that comes from a higher plane of thought from love itself. And that's how unifying consciousness sees the world there is no other that other is an aspect of me so where am I the technocrat inside me where I want control where I have to have it a certain way I have to have things I have to have everything in order so going back to chaos because I need to go there before I finish chaos is simply something we don't understand and it feels chaotic and we feel uncertain and then we feel insecure and vulnerable, and that becomes some form of uh, threat. We may not acknowledge it consciously or unconsciously. That's what chaos is. It's something we can't make sense of, but it doesn't mean it's nonsensical. It just means we cannot make sense of it. That means it's coming from a more a highly evolved space in the sense that we haven't got the knowledge to reach that understanding of what that means. Now, the wisdom would say, okay, I don't know. I know I don't know, and I'm not going to fear something I don't know. Let's be curious and see what it brings. So from chaos, apparent chaos, there is no chaos in truth. The universe is completely non-chaotic, but it can appear chaotic. A volcano can appear chaotic as it blasts all this sulfur into the atmosphere. That can seem like everyone gets into chaos. Oh, my God, the systems have all broken down. Our systems of control break down in natural eruptions or disruptions, to use that narrative. It's the breakdown of our systems that have a fake sense of control that break down 
when natural eruptions happen. And then we say, I don't want chaos, I want order because I feel safe. Harking back to the um, spiritual connect in the original narrative before I was talking about religion, let's get rid of the idea of organised thought through books and go straight to the divine connection. When you are anchored in that higher intelligence that created us, I didn't create me, it created me. When I defer to an intelligence way beyond myself that we can argue is chaotic or illogical, it, it's true, it is illogical. It's not, in, it's not the thought pattern, if there is such a thing, of that higher power, it's completely different to the human condition because it created all life, inclusive of extraterrestrial life inclusive of planetary systems we haven't even come across yet. So this is where the humility of humanity gets into balance here and says, you know what, there's many things I don't know, the knowing of which would change everything. So what appears to be apparent chaos is just we don't know and we can't control it, we fear it. This is our natural, it's not even natural, this is the insecure human condition that doesn't know itself. But again, once you anchor into that divine higher mind and you trust, and this is where religion had something to teach here, where you have faith in the divine, I won't call it order because it's, it's symmetrical. It's not an order in a linear sense. It's a symmetry. They're geometry, geometries. They're sacred geometries formulating the physical universe and they can be in life form at the microscopic level. So there is knowledge we do not know, the knowing of which would change the way we see, the way we treat each other. What I do know, and I'll finish now, is that higher intelligence in the physical realities, has as its basis of stability as love. And it is in the feminine. The nature is in the feminine. So when you cut off the female, the feminine, or the feminine within yourself, you're cutting off an aspect of nature, which is balance which is harmony. That's why we go to extremes. We, have, we create extremists because we're out of balance. But instead of recognising the inherent flaw in the way that we are thinking and raising our families, we instead go after the enemy and we end on this endless war footing which diverts resources away from where it's most needed, the hungry, the rebalancing of the planetary systems, the reformulating of the of an uh, an earth that no longer controls but supports all life. This is why the well-being budget came out of New Zealand because there's a feminine energy there. It's not to suppress that and keep on with GDP when GDP doesn't work. Gross domestic product, gross national product is an end game scenario. It's, it's, it's defunct as a forward-moving um, conceptualization that brings us wealth and stability it doesn't you have melting ice caps we are seeing massive disruption in nature far greater than the it disruption but the it disruption is so it's so focused on its path that it must embed all these senses and technologies in order to control and create this fourth industrial revolution to maximize trillion dollars of profit to benefit the bankers and the technocrats and the rest can go eat cake. That's not a recipe for global governance that balances all competing interests to ensure peace on earth. And that is where I'm going to leave this video. It's up to you whether you take it on board or not. I'm, it's coming directly from the heart. And that was in my dream as I awakened this morning was to talk about the replacing of 
an imperfect but somewhat of a protective system of democracy, which does have housed within it, whether it's in reality or not, certainly within the human consciousness, they believe they have rights and they believe their government serves them. Being replaced with a technocracy which says tick the box and we're going to ignore, we're going to put everything into algorithms, we're going to ignore what you want. You have to fit in. That won't work. And it's going to cause huge disruption within the IT sector and towards it because it's not in harmony with the whole and love is not the modus operandi of creating the technology. That is the fundamental flaw in the whole smart cities, smart world philosophy, which has been pitched as utopia. It's not. It's going to be hell on earth for, for many. <laughs> anyway, that's my contribution. Um, take it or leave it. <laughs> I'm excluded or included on this basis, I guess. <laughs> anyway, I love you. Bye.